Hey guys, welcome to another Trade Genius Podcast. Bob and Phil here as always. Boy, do we have another chart to show you guys. Guaranteed fireworks one way or the other. You're not going to want to miss this one, so let's dive in. Trade Genius. Hey buddy, it's Bob with Trade Genius. Hey, it is holiday season and our holiday specials are running right now. Just promo code HOLIDAY. You already blew it, you missed the Black Friday specials, but this is your second chance to take advantage of some of the best pricing that we do for the year. Check us out, tradelegagenius.com, tradegenius.co, tradegeniusacademy.com. All roads lead to Trade Genius. Check us out, incredible deals. Thanks for listening. Hey, Bob, it's alligator jaw season. This one's pretty good uh, no. because either way, we're going to see extreme volatility, I think, as these jaws close one way or the other. So can you talk us through this 10-year uh, SPX relationship? Yeah, I mean, look, for the longest time, uh, and you can throw the chart up there now, too, while we're talking, Phil. For the longest time, for many, many, many years, um, there's a correlation between the 10-year and the SPX. And like everything else, we had this massive separation in the fall where there's an anticipation that yields are going to collapse and that's going to uh, justify the price for uh, the SPX. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse because the CPI data yesterday told us that Powell's not going to be in a position to lower rates because he's gonna, he will cause a basically a, an inflation resurgence. And we know that's not good news. But at the same time, at some point, people are going to recognize the fact that Janet Yellen is increasing the, the U.S. money supply by 5% a year just on deficit spending. And that will continue to drive the yield of the 10-year higher over time. We're starting to see that weakness again, Phil. And she's at a point too where she can't really keep doing these uh, T-bills. And so this, these jaws are going to snap shut. And the question is going to be, you know, uh, who's going to win this thing? You know, we know Janet Yellen, her preference would be for the yields to collapse and the S&P 500 to remain elevated. But we have no historical precedence for that. And the other the other side of it is that yields remain elevated and spy collapses. And we do have precedence for that. And even even um, the quant guys are saying that based on the, the borrowing needs of the government is that we're looking at probably a 5% yield in the 10 year this year. And when, when that happens, then the competition for, for the bonds that are going to put on display are going to overwhelm the desire for people to be in a stock market that is at absolutely astronomical price earnings ratio. So I think the point is, you know, and you're going to show a seasonal chart in a minute, but we're in a kind of a really simple zone here, Phil. You know, if if the market breaks out of the high from the, the sell off from the CPI report, then we could do another FIB extension. You know, I had 503 as my FIB extension. I'll have to look at the next FIB extension above that. We had 480, 503. I'll have to see what's above that. But if we break the CPI number low and break 490 on SPY, then I think we could probably see a pretty good cascade down in price. And you have some seasonal charts you want to show too to maybe give support that no matter what happens this week, you know, the next couple of weeks may not be that bullish. Yeah, and this is why, Bob, I, I kind of favor the S&P 500 catching down to that inverted 10-year yield chart. So uh, because I think the bond market is kind of positioning for a pullback and, and that's why the chart looks the way it does. But you're having like derivatives uh, squeezing on the S&P 500. But if you look at the seasonal chart here, which I want to bring up, uh, you'll notice that if you look toward the lower uh, left corner in February, in the middle of February, which is right where we're at, you'll notice that February and, and middle of February typically is where you're getting your uh, options expiration. And and so seasonally, uh, post February OPEX is very bearish and you pull back into the end of the month, find some footing uh, through the middle of March, and then you begin your seasonal bull run uh, towards summer. You know, that's why I think that it's very appropriate that that chart we just looked at is going to close that gap. And I think it's going to be instead of the 10 year uh, moving, I think it's going to be the S&P 500 catching up to what the bond market is pricing in. So I think seasonally, uh, and along with some other data points that we've covered, I think there's a high probability that we're going to see that seasonal March pullback. Now, I would say that if you don't see anything manifesting by the end of next week, you know, you got to be, you know, play the chart, right? We could be, we could be pushing up higher and maybe bucking seasonality a little bit, or maybe it's, we get a pullback a little bit later in the month. But if we don't do much, the bears have a two week window as all of these post OPEC windows that come up, bears have basically a two week window. And the reason for that is, 
all of the hedges reset uh, for the next monthly OPEX. And this next one is big because it's the big March quarterly OPEX. And open interest on this is going to be very, very high. So uh, bears, if they're able to really push this market down lower, they could do a lot of technical damage. That being said, if they can't get much done to the downside by the end of the month, they're going to lose any momentum that they've built up. And then the minute you start shifting those higher time frame charts with higher highs, uh, you know, see you later. Because I think whatever they do to the downside, I think that's they can't if they don't do enough. That's your launch point for attacking the highs that we put in here uh, in February. So I think there's your probabilities for those jaws to close on that S&P 500 and 10 year chart that you showed us. It's going to be really interesting what sectors is going to perform because really it's, it's all about one sector right now. You know, we're going into energy seasonal strength, but, you know, today they pushed the market up and they pushed energy down. So, you know, so they're still playing that game. And, and so it's going to be interesting to see what can do. Pharmaceuticals, biotech has been getting a little bit of bid, at least the stuff that I own had been moving. But that's probably the only thing I could detect. I mean, every commodity out there that says the market is economic growth is going to happen is, is basically flatlined. They're all on CPR. And so I don't know who's carrying the market. Is it going to be NVIDIA to 2000? You know, is it going to be SMCI to 2000? Uh, the PE ratios are getting absolutely ridiculous in price. And I think that's what everybody just says. I think maybe that's what's going to happen. You know, but if we break 503, then we're just going to have to enjoy the show because it's it's going to probably blow the top off of everybody's protection, I think. And then you know what happens then, Phil, when it, that ends up. I think we can throw the seasonals out the door because whenever that breaks, it's going to retrace 88% of that from the October low, and it's going to be pretty scary. But this market has just been perplexing, at least for me. You know, I mean, obviously you're trading what's in front of you, but, you know, none of it makes any sense whatsoever because we just can't see behind the plumbing on some of these. The leverage behind the scenes must be just absolutely insane, Phil. Well, I, no, I think it is. And I think that's why you saw the squeeze you saw into the end of the year and, and into January, because all of the, like they say, the carry the carryover of the gains, right, from the previous uh, six months. And all that's all it is. It's really just rolling rolling the gains. But that, you know, two-way street, right? And at some point, all of this up upside leverage betting is going to bite somebody in the butt, and that's going to create a bit of a domino effect. But I think where the rubber meets the road, again, is going to be not what you and I already know is, is, is cooking under the hood, but when that data really starts to hit. Because, and I think what's going to happen too, and this is why I think if you look at TLT when it broke 88, the institutions were in there buying under 88, right? And then after the the bottom is in, then it's then you start hearing about where, you know, the long side of the bond market is where you want to be. And I think the same thing is going to happen. I think those guys know when the data is going to look really bad. Uh, and I think for the headlines, it's going to be unemployment and claims and things like that. Building permits is already showing cracks in the dam on uh, that stuff. Uh, we'll probably show you guys later in the week. But the larger money, the smart money is already going to be starting to hedge into that. And I think it's going to be uh, seasonal because that's, you know, seasonality. There's a reason for seasonality. Uh, it has a lot to do with the time of the year and and the different uh, quarters booking different things for these companies, these banks. So I think seasonality is definitely something we're going to have to pay attention to. But I think if you're looking at it from the standpoint of where do the institutions look to hedge for a larger correction, I think it's going to be into that move from March into June. And I think it's going to be anticipation of things like unemployment, things like claims starting to go south after May, June. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, how often, how, how much bigger can the part-time job number support right. the unemployment? Just skewing, I mean, yeah. PayPal just did a 10% reduction in, I mean, how many companies have been laying off 10% of their, of their staff? Right. I mean, kind of scary. You you know, I mean, you know, setting all this aside, you know, this banter you and I do, I mean, I just really feel bad for people in their 50s getting blown out. There's a chart, I mean, I'll have to find it, but we have excess retirees, Phil, primarily because these people in the 50s and early 60s are getting blown out of jobs and are just leaving the workforce and, and trying to either get on disability or get on early Social Security, anything they need to do to survive. And at some point, they're drawing down out of their, their 401ks to live. And that's going to be a secular problem once this thing really takes hold, I think. Absolutely. All right, guys, let us know your thoughts on today's video. Love to hear from you. Leave them in the comments below. If you are interested in navigating these markets, because it's going to get pretty tricky as we progress through this year, head over to tradegenius.co and check out our packages over there. You can get in the room with us. We'll help you navigate through these markets and give you our thoughts day to day. Thanks, Bob. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Take care. Trade Genius.